Good morning. Okay, so I'm sitting here with Joey because she just smashed her fingers in the drawer and she's in a lot of pain. So she has to sit with daddy. Can you say hi? hi. Say, how are you? Hi. Say, I miss you. miss you. Okay, we're gonna read the last two chapters. This is it. Remember, there's no Joseph. It goes straight from Mahmud to Isabel. Starting off with Isabel, the last thing we found out about Joseph was that his mom, they got caught by the Nazis and his mom had to choose between one of the two kids to set free and the other one would go to a concentration camp, which is a total, just a horrible, horrible decision that any person would have to make, especially about their children. So here's Isabel. Um, remember, they uh, they landed in Miami. They just beat the, go the Coast Guard to get to shore. Mama had her baby. I mean, it was just crazy, frantic time, but they made it. Everybody there is celebrating, giving them food, giving them water, and all that stuff. Here's Isabel, Miami, Florida, 1994. Home. This was the coda to Isabel's song. She stood with a trumpet in hand, a gift from Uncle Guillermo, Lito's brother. She wasn't on a sidewalk in Havana, but in the classroom in Miami. It was her second week of school and the first day of band class, the day they auditioned for their places in the orchestra. Okay, so, oh, you went down? Okay, she feels better now. So time has passed. This is definitely the resolution here because a lot of our answers are gonna be, or a lot of our questions are gonna be answered and uh, there's gonna be resolution, right? Isabel twiddled her fingers on the trumpet's keys. She couldn't believe she was standing here in this classroom less than a month after stumbling onto Miami Beach with her baby brother in her arms. So much has changed so quickly. After her mother and brother had been taken to the hospital and given a clean bill of health, Lito's brother, Guillermo, took them in until they found a little apartment of their own. His apartment was smaller than their houses in Cuba and not near the beach, but if Isabel never saw the ocean again, that was fine by her. Little Mariana was at home getting fat and happy along with the other babies mommy was paid to watch at the little in-house daycare she ran. Poppy had gotten a job driving a taxi and was saving up for a car of their own. Senora Castillo, so here's all these characters like resolutions, right? Like kind of putting an end to, to all of these character stories. Senora Castillo planned to go back to school to become an American lawyer. American lawyer. And Senor Castillo was already talking to someone about getting a loan to open a restaurant. Luis got work in a little bodega and Amara in a dress shop. And once Amara became a U.S. citizen, she planned to become a Miami police officer. They were going to be married in the winter. And Isabel. She had started the sixth grade. It was hard because she didn't speak English yet, but there were other Cuban kids there. Lots more Cuban kids. A few had, been, had come to America by boat like her, but more who had been born here. Cuban, Cubano-Americanos who still spoke Spanish at home. Isabel had quickly made friends, girls and boys who were warm and welcoming and she knew she would learn to speak English like her teachers soon enough. She was practicing by watching lots and lots of TV. At least that's what she told her parents. She would learn and in the meantime, math and Spanish and art class all still made sense. And so did music. Senor Villanueva and the other students waited for her to play. Isabel had practiced for weeks for this moment. At first, she couldn't decide what song to play, but then while watching a baseball game with her father, she had it figured out. I bet it's take me out to the... Isabel adjusted Yvonne's industrial baseball cap on the... Oh, on her head, took a deep breath and began to play the Star Spangled Banner. National Anthem of the United States. But she didn't play it like she'd heard it at the baseball games on TV. She played it like a song cubano, offbeat with a guararo melody. Isabel played it, salsa for Ivan, lost at sea and for Lito back in Cuba. She played it salsa for her mother and her father who had left their homeland and for her little brother Mariano who would never know the streets of Havana the way she had. And Isabel played it salsa for herself so she would never forget where she came from, who she was. Soon, Isabel had everyone in the room clapping along to the beat with her, but as she played, she heard a different rhythm, a beat underneath the one everyone else was clapping to. Her foot tapped in time with the hidden cadence, and she realized with a thrill that she was finally hearing it. She was finally counting Clave. Lita was wrong. 
She didn't have to be in Havana to hear it, to feel it. She had brought Cuba with her to Miami. Isabel finished with a flourish and Senor Villanuevo and the other students cheered her on. She thought she might cry for happiness, but she bit back her tears. She had done enough crying over Ivan and Lito. The song of her leaving Cuba to find a new home was over. Today, it was time to start a new song. There's some good closure right there. I mean, that's a good way to end her story, right? We still don't know what's going on with Joseph. There's one chapter left with Mahmoud. It's only like four and a half pages. Ah, really, really, really hoping there's some closure there and some closure with Joseph. Like we can't be left without knowing what happened to Joseph and his family, right? Here's Mahmoud, Berlin, Germany, 2015. Okay, Berlin, Germany. Is that, so does, does Joseph go, is he the one that's taken to the concentration camp and 60, 70 years later, he'd be in, the, in his 80s or whatever. Was he set free, didn't get killed in the concentration camp because the war was over? Is that going to be some sort of connection? I don't know. Here we go. But that's where Mahmoud is right now in Berlin, Germany, 2015. Home. A German song Mahmoud had never heard before played on the radio of the van that took him and his family through the streets of Berlin. The capital of Germany was the biggest city he had ever seen, far bigger than Aleppo. It was filled with nightclubs and cafes and shops and monuments and statues and apartments and office buildings. Almost all the signs were in German, but here and there he saw a sign in Arabic advertising a clothing store or a restaurant or a market. Buildings lined the sidewalks like ten-story walls of brick and glass and cars and bicycles and buses and trams rattled and honked and clanged by in the streets. This strange, frightening, exciting place was to be Mahmoud's new home. The German government had taken in Mahmoud and his family. For the past four weeks, the four of them had lived in a school in Munich that had been turned into simple but clean housing for refugees. They'd stayed there, free to come and go as they pleased, until a host family agreed to let them share their home while Mahmoud's parents got on their feet. A host family here on this street in the capital of this country. The van pulled up to the curb outside a little green house with white shutters and an A-frame roof. Flowers filled the window boxes like Mahmoud had seen in Austria, and two German cars were parked in the driveway. Across the street in a park, teenagers did tricks on skateboards. Mahmoud's father slid open the side door for them to climb out, and Mahmoud and his mother and brother grabbed the backpacks filled with the, clo with the clothes, toiletries, and bedrolls the German relief workers had given them. The relief worker who'd driven them led Mahmoud's mother... Oh, that's going to be him. That's going to be Joseph. The relief worker who'd driven them led Mahmoud's mother and father and brother up the steps of the front door of the little house, but Mahmoud stood for a moment on the sidewalk, looking around at the neighborhood. Mahmoud knew from his history class back in Syria that Berlin had been all but destroyed by the end of World War II, reduced to a pile of rubble like Aleppo was now, so many years ago. Would it take another 70 years for Syria to return from the ashes the way Germany had? Would he ever see Aleppo again? Cries of joy and welcome came from the porch and Mahmoud followed his family up the steps. His mother was being hugged by an elderly German woman. Here we go. Here we go. Elderly key word. Joseph, the war was probably over when he was captured, sent to the, sent to the concentration camp. Um, they released him from the concentration camp. He lived and now he's an elderly man married to this elderly German woman. Let's see. Here we go. His mother was being hugged by an elderly German woman and an elderly German man was shaking hands with his father. The German relief worker had to translate everything everyone said to each other. Mahmoud and his family didn't speak Germany, German yet and the family apparently didn't speak any Arabic. The German family had at least managed a sign written in Arabic that said, welcome home on it. Even if the expression they had used was a bit formal, Mahmoud still appreciated the effort. It was better than he could do in German. The man shaking hands with his father turned to Mahmoud and Walid, and what Mahmoud saw surprised him. He was a really old man. He had wrinkly white skin and thin white hair that stuck out a bit on the sides like he tried to comb it, but it wouldn't stay put. 
when the relief worker, th this has to be it. I mean, this has to be it. There's no Joseph chapter. He's an elderly man. 70 years later, he was, what, 13 at the time, so he'd be 83. When the relief worker had told him they'd be staying with a German family, Mahmoud had imagined a family like his own, not like his grandparents. Sorry, I just read ahead a little bit. His name is Saul Rosenberg. Okay. So isn't it Joseph Lando? Unless he changed his name. The relief worker translated. And he says, welcome to your new home. As Mahmoud shook the old man's hand, he spotted a small, thin, ornate wooden box attached to the frame just outside the front door. Oh, maybe, okay. Maybe Joseph's sister... Maybe this is Joseph's sister's husband, right? And so it's trying to lead us to believe that this is Joseph, but it's not. It's actually Joseph's sister's husband. As Mahmoud shook the old man's hand, he spotted a small, thin, ornate wooden box attached to the frame just outside the front door. Mahmoud recognized the symbol on the box. It was the Star of David, the same symbol on the flag of Israel. Mahmoud tried not to show his surprise. Not only was this couple old, but they were Jewish. Back in the Middle East, Mahmoud knew Jews and Muslims had been fighting each other for decades. This was a strange new world. Herr Rosenberg's wife broke away from Mahmoud's mother and bent down to say hello. She was a wide woman, white-haired like her husband, with big round glasses and a gap-toothed friendly smile. From the pockets of her frock, with she withdrew a little stuffed rabbit made of white corduroy and offered it to Walid. There it is. Okay, so does this does this mean that Joseph was sent to the concentration camp and died and his sister, what's his sister name? Sister's name I keep I keep forgetting. But she was the one that was set free. I mean, there it is, the little stuffed rabbit. Didn't she have that all along? His eyes lit up as he took it from her. Frau Ros Rosenberg made it herself. She's a toy designer, the translator explained. <clears throat> the old <clears throat> excuse me, the old woman said something directly to Mahmoud. She says she would have made one for you too, the translator said, but she thought you might be too old for stuffed animals. Mahmoud nodded. She can make one for my little sister, though, for when we find her, he told the relief worker. We had to hand her off to another boat to save her when we were drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. It was my fault. I'm the one who told my mother to do it, and now I have to find her and bring her back. Mrs. Rosenberg looked questioningly at the relief worker as he translated, and her bright smile faded. Walid ran off to show his mother his new toy, and the old woman led Mahmoud into the hallway just inside the house where family pictures hung on the wall. Y'all know what's coming, right? I was a refugee once, just like you, the old woman said through the interpreter, and I lost my brother. She pointed to an old brown photograph in a picture frame of a mother and father and two children, a boy about Mahmoud's age and glasses and a little girl. The father and son wore suits and ties and the mother wore a pretty dress with big buttons. The girl was just dressed just like a little sailor. That's me right there. The girl, that's my family. We left Germany on a ship in 1939 trying to get to Cuba to escape the Nazis. I was very little then, and I'm very old now, and I don't remember too much about that time, but I do remember my father being very sick. And a cartoon about a cat. I remember that, and, and a very nice policeman who let me wear his hat. My father was the only one to make it to Cuba. He lived there for many years, long after the war, but I never saw him again. He died before we could find each other. The rest of us couldn't leave the ship with him, and... No other country would take us, so they brought us back to Europe just in time for the war. Just in time to go on the run again. The Nazis caught us, and they gave my mother a choice. Save me, or save my brother. Well, she couldn't choose. I mean, how could she? So, my brother chose for her. His name was Joseph. Mahmoud watched as she reached out and gently touched the boy in the photograph, leaving a smudge on the glass. It was about your age, I think. I don't remember much about him, but I do remember he always wanted to be a grown-up. 
I don't have time for games, he would tell me. I'm a man now. And when those soldiers said one of us could go free and the other would be taken to a concentration camp, Joseph said, just take me. My brother, just a boy, becoming a man at last. She paused a moment, then took the picture down off the wall reverently with both hands. They took my mother and my brother away from me that day and left me alone there in the woods. I only survived because a kind old French lady took me in. She told the next Nazis who came knocking that I was part of her family. And when the war was over, I was old enough. I, I came back here to Germany to look for my mother and my brother. I searched for them a long time, but they had died in the concentration camps, both of them. The woman drew a breath. I only have this picture of them because a cousin kept it, a cousin who was hidden away by a Christian family throughout the war. Here in Germany, I met my husband, Saul. He had also survived the Holocaust. We stayed because he had family here and we made a family of our own, she said. She spread her arms wide and turned in the little hallway, showing Mamu the dozens of pictures of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She put her hand to the old yellowed picture of her family again. They died so that I could live. Do you understand? They died so that all these people, this entire family could live. <clears throat> all the grandchildren and the nieces and the nephews, they never got to meet. But you'll get to meet them, she told Mahmoud. You're still alive and so is your little sister somewhere. I just know it. You saved her and, and together we'll find her. Yes, I promise we'll find her and we'll bring her home. Mahmoud started to cry and he turned away and tried to blink back his tears. The old Jewish woman put her arms around him and pulled him into a tight hug. Everything's going to be all right now, she whispered. We'll help you. Ruthie, come here. Frau Ros Rosenberg's husband called to her. Mamu didn't need the translator to tell him that Mrs. Rosenberg wanted them to join him in the living room. Mamu dragged a sleeve across his wet eyes and Mrs. Rosenberg tried to hang the picture back on the wall. Her old hands are too shaky though and Mamu took it from her and hung it back on its nail for her. His gaze lingered on the picture. He was filled with sadness for the boy his age, the boy who had died so Ruthie could live. Hold on. But Mahmoud was also filled with gratitude. Joseph had died so Ruthie could live and one day welcome Mahmoud and his family into her home. The old woman, think about that for a second. Think about the chain reaction that took place because of Joseph's decision. Yes, by the way, I'm still wearing this shirt. It's been like five days straight because I love it. Don't judge me. Um... Think about the chain of events that took place simply because Joseph made that decision. Joseph made that sacrifice. And there's a huge family tree, a family line now that survived because of, of that. And now Mahmoud, honestly, and his family has been saved because of Joseph's decision 70 years ago. The old woman gave Mahmoud's arm a squeeze and she led him into the living room. Mom and dad were there and Walid and... Mr. Rosenberg and the space was bright and alive and filled with books and pictures of family and the smell of good food felt like home. And that, my friends, is the end of Refugee. What a book. What a remarkable book. I mean, think about the journey. First of all, the journey that we were on with this book and, and tagging along with all three of these characters what a ride. I mean, what an emotional roller coaster from, from being scared, sharks jumping into the water, being frantic, uh, being excited, being sad, being happy, being relieved. I felt all these emotions. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the sign of a good book when you can feel all of these emotions as you're going along the journey with these characters. What an awesome, awesome ride. I loved it. I mean, this book is up there. It's it's up there top three for me, I think. I think it's Where the Red Fern Grows, Sidekicked, and Refugee. I mean, that was just a, a fantastic, fantastically written book. Here's your assignment. By the next time we meet on Friday for our Zoom meeting, I want you to figure out one theme. Remember, a theme is a lesson that we can learn as readers by reading this book. 
through the problems the characters endured, through all the situations that they endured, the, the solutions that they came up with to those problems. I want you to come up with one theme. And I think there are many themes, obviously, in this book. There can be different themes for each character, right? But I think there's this overarching theme that the author, Alan Gratz, is trying for us to, to understand and grasp. And I want you to think about that. So on Friday, jump into the Zoom meeting, and we'll go around and talk about what we think the theme is. Hope you guys enjoy this book. Man, I loved, absolutely loved this book. Stay tuned. I'll see you guys on Friday. Miss you. Love you.